Welcome, Dan Mama. So far in this series of mini-documentaries, I've covered unreleased consoles and computers and pretty much all the big manufacturers that entertained us in the 80s and early 90s. We've looked at wonders such as the Atari Mirai, the Sega Neptune, the Sinclair FC3, the Mattel Intellivision 3, and most recently, of course, the Commodore 900. Now, there is one big manufacturer that I've yet to cover, a company that released countless consoles, produced many popular games and beloved franchises, and is still a big part of the industry to this day. Now, I bet most people watching this just shouted Nintendo at the screen, right? Wrong. I was actually talking about Bandai, of course. Okay, there is a strong Nintendo connection with this story too, but they were not the company I was explaining, and you're probably now wondering how on earth that description relates to Bandai and not Nintendo. Okay, so bear with me here while I explain a bit further. Bandai are probably best known for being a hugely successful manufacturer of toys, such as Gundam, Tamagotchi, Thundercats, Dragon Ball Z, and Doraemon, among many others. So obviously a move into video games only seemed natural with such an impressive product list. Today the company is closely associated with arcade giants Namco, the creators of Pac-Man, who they merged with in 2005, but they have a very rich history in the industry that extends right back to the 70s. They started off producing the popular TV Jack consoles in the late 70s, a series of plug and play Pong clones that could be collected up to your telly to play several different variations of the game. This was followed up in 1979 by the Bandai Supervision 8000, a proper cartridge based console with a Z80 CPU, AY sound chip, and full colour graphics. Unfortunately, it was a massive failure, with just seven games being released over its short three year lifespan. Rather than gamble on their own hardware again, Bandai then made the sensible choice to license and distribute their own versions of popular American consoles. So we had a Bandai badge version of the MV Vetrix, their own version of the Mattel Intellivision, and perhaps most importantly, a regional variant of the Arcadia 2001. Originally developed by Emerson Radio, the Arcadia hardware was then licensed out to different manufacturers around the world to produce their own versions. In fact, over 30 different variants of the console exist, from companies such as Grandstand, Toshibo and Hanimax. But the Bandai version is particularly notable because it received four games that were exclusive to the Japanese market, in the form of Doraemon, Dr. Slump, Mobile Soldier Gundam and Super Dimension Force Macross. These are highly sought after by collectors. After the less than resounding success of all these consoles, Bandai's video game division then spent some time producing games for the Famicom and NES, such as Athletic World, Dick Tracy, and of course, the much talked about stadium events. But as the 90s rolled around, they wanted to get back into making consoles, and we saw three more arrive in quick succession. First, there was the Playdia in 1994, a console squarely aimed at younger children with games based on popular Bandai properties such as Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, Ultraman and Hello Kitty. The failure of their kids console then sent them into complete opposite direction, as they teamed up with Apple to create the ill-fated Pippin, a system squarely aimed at adults with multimedia capabilities and computer-like functionality. Launched in 1996, it was discontinued just a year later after miserable sales of just 42,000 units.
One last throw of the dice saw Bandai launch the Wonderswan handheld in 1999 and the updated Wonderswan Colour just a year later. A further revision called the Wonderswan Crystal also arrived in 2002. This probably tells you already that the handheld was pretty successful. Bandai had finally cracked it, but they never felt confident enough to go head to head with Nintendo outside of Japan, so it sadly never got the widespread visibility that it so richly deserved. So with such a huge array of different consoles under their belt, you can now see why I talked about their legacy in the industry. But there is one console I left out here, one that sadly never saw the light of day, and one that was also one that came about through their friendship with Nintendo. That console is the Bandai Home Entertainment Terminal, and its story is the main subject of this video. The Bandai HGT was first announced in 1993, and subsequently shown at the Tokyo Toy Show that very same year, to great interest. In fact, the video footage you can see here was taken from that very show. There's commentary in Japanese that tells us a bit more, but I've removed that here. If you understand Japanese and want to view it in its original form, then follow the link in the top right hand corner of the screen. So what was the HET then? Put simply, it was an officially licensed laptop version of the Super Famicom, with a tiny 4 inch colour LCD screen, built in detachable controller, stereo speakers and expansion slots. It's the latter of these that makes the device most interesting, as it was intended that this laptop console could be expanded to take in multimedia-like functions. Bandai boasted that you would be able to connect a keyboard, CD-ROM drive, modem and printer to the home entertainment terminal. Sadly, none of this was ever shown though, and it seems like the only thing that exists from the project is the grainy video you see here. Unfortunately, very little is known about the creation of the console or the true reasons for its cancellation. It's rumoured that Nintendo were unhappy with the functionality of the device and so pulled the licensing deal needed for Bandai to retail it. I would argue that there are other factors involved though, which make more sense the further you analyse them. Firstly, there is the tiny screen, which just seems too small to play SNES games on. This would be fine on a handheld, but it looks out of place on a unit as bulky as this. Then there is the question of battery life. No doubt it would have been far from ideal. Lastly, you have to look at the main selling point of the unit that Bandai promoted so heavily and hinted at in the name, the expandability. The HET is already quite bulky for a portable device, but start adding on things like a printer, CD-ROM drive and other peripherals and it becomes even more so. And why even bother when you could just go out and buy a far more useful laptop PC, which were coming on leaps and bounds in the mid-90s. Having already tried and failed with so many other consoles before the HET, I don't think it would have taken much for Bandai to get cold feet and abandon the project. It's a shame though because part of me thinks this is pretty damn cool and wants to give it a try. But what do you think? Do you think Bandai could have succeeded where they previously failed and made a success out of the HET? Please let me know in the comments, I'm always interested to hear your theories and opinions. But before I go, I must thank all my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and help make videos like this possible. So special thanks go to Funder Fundington, John DiLiberto, Keith, Carl Olson, Larry Anderson, Mark Lawrence, Mr. Caboto, Psycho Lavos, Cold R Fusion, and Scott McGuire. If you want to do the same, then go check out my Patreon right now and get access to loads of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, and I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon. <laughs> さあ、ね。
大きな画面で楽しさいっぱい